today of all days, because it is the three months today since Her Late Majesty died. Is it? Really? And I was just yes. reflecting coming in here how extraordinary the atmosphere was in the ten days after her death. I don't know if either of you covered the funeral at all, but I was working for the BBC at the time, and so I had ten days of going every day down to Buckingham Palace and crossing Green Park on foot and meeting the thousands, eventually tens of thousands of people who were going to leave flowers and Paddington Bears and poems. And there was a wonderful atmosphere. The first few days, there was quite a lot of tears. And then people actually thought, well, she was 96, an amazing life, what an achievement. But there was still this feeling of people taking children and grandchildren to be part of history. But there was something very easy in the air. People were friendly with one another. And there were people of all shapes, sizes, ages and types. And I... Eventually, I think I worked out what it was, uh, because this is, is quite extraordinary, and the atmosphere is extraordinary. And I thought, actually, when we go home, we turn on the television and we see the news, and it was very, there was a lot of terrible stuff from Ukraine then, as now. And I thought, of course, we're touching something that is good here. There was the Queen, 70 years, <laughs> made a commitment to 21. She kept all her life. And she was good, she was kind, she was decent, she was consistent. And I felt people were reaching out to, almost to touch that goodness. And I thought, this is wonderful. And then the 10 days ended, we had the funeral, and then the world seemed to become grim. All of a sudden, all over, did you feel that at all? Well, it's, that's a really good point to make. Uh, whilst we were in that period of national grief and mourning, I think, like a lot of people, I rather hoped that something lasting would come mm. from that kind of unified feeling. And actually, I went down to Buckingham Palace with my dog uh, and members of my household who wanted to accompany me, and it was a wonderful atmosphere. But you're right to say it didn't last. And, and, and how quickly we've come to today, where the way that the royal family is being discussed is back to, I think, the butcher's board. Well, except I've come to the conclusion, having watched only an hour of the Harry and Meghan documentary this morning, that actually it, it doesn't... I mean, it's, it's interesting to see in a way, and well done them, they've, you know, letting their voice be heard. But it doesn't affect the course of royal history one jot. I think this Do you think a, it doesn't? No, I don't think... Curiously, I thought it was... I was sort of all ready for, you know, where are the bombs going to be? What, where are the going? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I thought, no, actually, this is about them and their concerns and their anxieties, perfectly reasonable, about being people in the public eye and all of that. But actually, the institution of the royal family, the thing that's been going and evolving over more than a 1,000 years, this is but a, This is a sort of hiccup and it is a sideshow. One of the frustrations for Prince Harry, and that's why I think he's calling his book Spare, and why he warmed to it when somebody suggested, let's call it Spare. They obviously were thinking of, you know, an heir and a spare. But actually, he is spare. He's not part of the show. And the show is, curious as it is, it's this running thing that has been going through our history. And I was reflecting, again, going back to the Queen's death, how Queen Victoria, 100 years ago, 120 years ago when she died, it was a global event, but then Britain was a global country. Now we are not. We're the sixth, seventh largest GDP in the world, the 21st most populous country, and yet more people turned up, more heads of state, princes, prime ministers, presidents came to London for the funeral of the Queen than had ever gathered in one city in the history of the world. And it was because of her nature, her personality, and her position. Now, Harry is an interesting character and a remarkable character. I have a son-in-law who's in the army and served with him in Afghanistan and will not hear a word said against him. Says this is a really good chap. Fantastic. Um, so, obviously a good person. I know, I do know, much loved and admired by the Queen. Um, uh, obviously, for Invictus Games, his service, also his personality. Whenever Harry phoned Windsor, uh, he was put straight through, always. Um, she loved him, she loved all her grandchildren, but she loved him, and welcomed Meghan, I, I know this, and interestingly said to Meghan, originally, uh, you're an actress by profession, if you want to carry on doing that, you should, you must, you must follow your calling. But, but Meghan said no, she wanted to be part of this, particularly showed an interest in the Commonwealth, and the Queen was delighted by that. And then the Queen took her, you know, on her first solo outing, took Megan, and she took her, I was delighted to see, to my old constituency. I used to be an MP in the city of Chester. I'm afraid it wasn't anything to do with me. It was because the Queen saw that she was going to be opening a theatre that day. So she thought, Megan, actress, theatre. And I have, on every account, not just the Queen's, but also the Lord Lieutenant of Cheshire, who was there that day, Megan was brilliant. 
she absolutely did it perfectly. She, you know, was one step behind the Queen. She was delightful, and everyone, it was, and everyone thought, oh, this is going to be fantastic. And the Queen was enthusiastic and said, this is, you know, welcome, uh, and suggested to her that maybe Sophie Wessex, as a, sort of one of the most recent persons joining the royal family, would be a good person to be a kind of mentor. And that's when Meghan said, I don't think so. I've, I've got Harry, and rejected that from that suggestion from the Queen. And from then on in, obviously, it's ended up where it is now, which is exciting for them, living in America. It's new and different for them. Sad for us if we miss Harry, as I think people do. But I don't think it affects the course of royal history one shot. Can we talk about duty? Um, because this is... You have written... I don't know if you remember, Giles, you've written a book called Elizabeth, an Intimate Portrait. Yeah, I was supposed to be talking about that. <laughs> well, that was kind of but exclusively I, the reason Can I say, it. the reason I love coming to you, and yes. I loved you when in your earlier lives... Yes, don't talk about that now. Uh, yes. Well, we don't talk about that now, but I remember when I came to the canteen, I said, oh, we're going to do this in the canteen, because last time we did, I think, it was, I was outside Cafe Nero. Yes, yeah, so it was quite noisy. It was quite ah, busy, wasn't it? Yes. But the reason I've come is that I think... The reason I love you as broadcasters... We haven't said a word since you came in. No, it's that you listen. That's what we said. I've got nothing more to say now. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, oh, no, do you know what, Charles? We can talk about anything, but you're reason, right. Yeah. We're here to talk about <laughs> you know, my book and my live podcast your shows. Your bloody book, which, by the way, I've read. Good grief. Oh, uh, I know, absolutely. Um, well, and God, you're a quick, either a quick reader or they got you an early copy. I do, I, it was quite a, an early copy, and Good. I don't have a fabulous social life, Giles, so I'm just fine. Uh, and it's been cold. Um, no, what, you, there is a, a really interesting bit in the book where you accompany the Queen on a relatively routine sequence of engagements. I think yeah. it's back in 2000, yeah. early 2000s. And... God, I mean, it, it sounds quite... Honestly, it sounds quite dull. But she just keeps going. I mean, she doesn't bring a particular sparkle oh. to it, but she's diligent and she's dutiful and she smiles at people and her face used to ache at the end of the day. It was extraordinary. I, and the reason I picked... I've kept a diary. I first met the Queen in, on the 2nd of May, 1968. And if you meet the Queen, you remember it. She doesn't remember meeting you necessarily, but you remember <laughs> it. And I wrote it down. And I was, uh, this was a period, about 20 years ago, when people said, you know, the Queen was at, at her peak. This was her... And I spent many days with her, as you saw from the diary. And what was interesting is that for being... When she was the Queen, being the Queen was enough. Mm. She just needed to turn up. And she was always herself. Other people... Nobody's normal with the Queen. Um, uh, did either of you meet the Queen? No, no. Well, if you had, there's always a kind of nervous laughter in the room, and people, nobody's quite natural, but the Queen was always the same person. If she came in here and sat down and she felt she needed some lippy, she'd open her handbag and be doing her lipstick, and then would just chat to you quite normally. Nobody was normal with her, but she was normal with everybody. And it was sufficient to be the Queen. And it, she did nothing without, with much ceremony. That day, if it's the day I think you're referring to, she was unveiling a plaque. Mm. And there we all were standing by the plaque. And she just went over to it and pulled the string. That was it. <laughs> that was done. And then we were, there was a... Somebody said, oh, you must sign this, Your Majesty. And she signed the, a, a sort of big photograph or something. And she signed it. And then she said, well, where does this go now? Um, there, was, there was silence in the room. Nobody thought about that. So I thought, well, let's take command of this thing. So I said, here, Your Majesty. Oh, oh, good. That's what you think. Very hey, good. And up we got and we put the thing on the wall. Uh, she wasn't faultless, who amongst us is. And I think there's a suggestion that her real lack of interest in any kind of confrontation of any sort may have not done a great deal for some of her relatives, I mean, particularly her second son. I don't know about that. She wasn't like her mother. Her mother could put her head in the sand. Um, the Queen was very even-tempered very uh, easy in the sense, and, and, and very, she could see the two sides of every argument. She was very loving and very forgiving. And one of the things I'm very conscious of was that she w wanted so totally to be fair. That came home to me when I was at the Royal Variety performance with uh, the Duke of Edinburgh on one occasion. And he he would let you know if he'd enjoyed an act or not. You know, he'd applaud loudly, and though he'd look at the programme and say, oh, God, Elton John again. Oh, dear. Poor old anyway. Elton gets the right passion. Anyway, but, but the Queen applauded everything equally. And right. I said to her at the interval, Your Majesty, you seem to be enjoying the show. She said, well, yes, of course. I said, but you seem to be enjoying everything equally. Are you? She said, well, not entirely. But, I, you know, I like to applaud evenly because it's on television and their families might be watching. And I think she took that seriously, the idea. So... It was a matter of policy with her to be even-handed. Um, I don't think... Uh, she, well, the point I wanted to make was this. 
she never talked about individuals because she didn't want to be invidious about them. The one exception she made was if you talked to her about who she admired most. She'd met everybody, you know, from Frank Sinatra and Marilyn Monroe through to Vladimir Putin and Idi Amin. She had met them all. She singled out, if ever you said who was special, she always singled out um, Nelson Mandela. And the reason being, she always followed it in the same way, that 27 years in prison and emerged without rancor. And that was for her a philosophy. I mean, her faith was so fundamental to her. Yes, driven by duty, uh, made happy by her dogs and her horses, but sustained by her faith. And that she really took that seriously. I was standing at the back of a church with her, I think in Malmesbury, and it was the Book of Common Prayer. And I said, oh, it's marvellous, the Book of Common Prayer. And we looked at the programme, and there was the first prayer was Our Father, which art in heaven, the Lord's Prayer. And she said, pointing at it, she said, sometimes the Lord's Prayer is all you need. And she told me, because I said, my father, people of her generation, my father's generation, he said his prayers on his knees by his bedside every night. And the Queen did too. Uh, and it meant something. The Lord's Prayer meant something to her. So uh, when you speak about her, her, her children, I mean, in the book I, I write about how she actually was able to divide public duty, public obligation, and private problems. And so when it came to Prince Andrew, he explained what the, what the stories were. He put his case to her. She responded, apparently, with just one word after the first account, intriguing. Uh, but then came to the conclusion that as far as the royal family was concerned, he had to step back. But as far as she was concerned, she he was her son. And the next day, she made, cl made it clear she was by being photographed out riding with him. Can I just um, yeah. shoehorn in a quick question about, about the marriage to Philip? Because his, his persona was, was famously irascible. Mm. And uh, I can't... Having read the book, and I enjoyed it thoroughly, Giles, he actually comes across to me as almost unbearable at times. <laughs> and you, you make every attempt you can to get the man to emote, because there was real tragedy in his life, wasn't there? Absolutely. Particularly in his early life. He had a rotten childhood. And all he ever seems to say is, well, that's life. <laughs> yes, oh. People die. Uh, Death is part of life. But you're right. And he originally asked me to write the story. He invited me <laughs> to do the initial biography of him, a short biography, and then he wouldn't say anything. And I said to him, and he was so perverse, whatever you said, he contradicted it. So uh, you know, I'd say, I'd talk about your Navy years. He'd say, yes, but the first two words to come out of the Duke of Edinburgh's mouth always were, yes, but. So whatever you said, it was, yes, but. So I'd talk to him about the Navy. He said, yes, but I'd rather have been in the Air Force. <laughs> you know? And he said, why have you put, this is true, I showed him the proofs, he said, why have you put, I was uh, serving uh, on HMS Ramillies. I said, because you was, sir. You did. You gave me the logbooks, kind of, sir. You yeah. served, mentioned when dispatches, distinguished service. He said, I did not serve on HMS I said, you did serve on HMS Ramillies. You gave me the logbook. He said, I did not serve on HMS Ramillies. I served in HMS Ramillies. Oh, you don't live on your house, do you? You live in your house. Don't you know anything? Oh, God. And he asked you to do it. And he okay. asked me to do it. I'm very glad he did, because through him, I met, I mean, I, I found him fascinating and admirable too. But through him, I met the Queen. And this is absolutely true. When I was already writing the book, this is 25 years ago, at the Royal Variety Show, waiting outside the Royal Box, he arrived with the Queen and he said to the Queen, this is Giles Bradworth. Uh, and then he leant towards her and said, he's writing about you. And then he went right close to her ear. He said, be careful. He's going to cut you into little pieces. And the Queen looked quite alarmed. I blushed. And it was one of his jokes. He went off chuckling. That's sort of what I mean about him being a little, <laughs> a little difficult. But on that point, if yes. you'd had the opportunity to know something that none of us know about them or see something that was a bit untoward, would you have put it in a book? Um, or would you have kept it to yourself? No, I think... I mean, I think I have tried to sort of show what they were like, what their relationship was like. I mean, he wouldn't talk to me about it, but did occasionally show me... He gave me a quotation, for example, from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. He was a great reader, mm. and he admired him because he was the man who wrote The Little Prince, but was also an aviator. Mm. And the quotation read, Love consists not necessarily in gazing into one another's eyes, but in looking in the same direction. Oh, OK. And he gave me that after he'd refused. I said, you know, there are no pictures of you and the Queen holding hands and, you know, uh, and he just wouldn't answer. But then he did show me that. Um, so an oblique way of saying An oblique way of saying And after that meeting, one of the, uh, the Queen's private secretary pointed me in the direction of another quotation from Cyril Connolly, 
that if you that said if you want to look at the quality of a man look at the health of his wife which is very interesting and what he meant was the queen was until you know her last illness a wonderfully healthy robust yeah. person and throughout her life she was a robust person she was small but she was always sturdy uh, and they it worked for them and understanding other people's marriages is never easy um but for me it's been a fascinating thing to study and i come away from it uh, admiring them more admiring them both actually hugely and the attitude to life which was so different from harry mm. and megan's so look well, up look yes. out look look up look out don't talk about yourself yeah yeah, well, it's a, it's gosh, rule, what's happened there? Uh, we've only got about four minutes now to talk about your podcast. The reason I came in. Yes, uh, let's uh, quickly uh, talk about your podcast. Uh, so for people who've never come across it before, I mean, how daft they must be, it's all about words, isn't it? And it's just a delicious, indulgent festival of our language. I'm writing that down because that's the quote of the day. It's why I got up this morning. It's called Something Rhymes With Purple. And it's because something does. I didn't think anything did. I thought it was a word like silver, that for which there was no rhyme. But a herple apparently is, a, is walking with a limp. I've been friends with Susie Dent for about 30 years. And we love words. We love words and language. And so we get together uh, every week and it drops on a Tuesday morning. We talk about words and language. And we started doing it in theatres. Do you do yours in theatres? Yep. We've done a couple of yeah. shows, yes. Well, we do it at the Fortune Theatre in London. We're next on on the 18th of December. Then there's one in January on the 15th, one in February on the 19th. And basically, we just get together in the Fortune Theatre in the West End of London, in Covent Garden, and we talk about words and language. And the people come, and they call themselves the Purple People. <laughs> and we've had... Literally, ten, well, like you, we've been lucky enough to have tens of millions of downloads. Like you, we won the Best Entertainment Podcast Award. We haven't won that. Haven't, haven't you? No. no. You we, not? we won a comedy one, John. Oh, fine. Yeah. Well, but it's not about us. Keep going, because we haven't got very much time. Keep going, keep going. And, and people go, well, we do it at this theatre, and where they're showing the woman in black. And the last time we do it, we do it once a month, and the last time there was a, got to the questions, it's part two, it's sort of open to people, can ask, you know, what, what is the meaning of um, uh, caboodle? Where does it come from? Yes, or king, which I was fascinated by in your latest episode, which uh, is all about royal words. I'd never thought exactly. to actually examine king as a word. Well, a man in the gallery puts yeah. his hand up and says, when is the play beginning? He was staying at the hotel oh, no. next door and he thought he'd come to the Sunday matinee. <laughs> and he was totally confused. But I bet he enjoyed your show all the same. He stayed to the very end. Brilliant. People do. And during the interval, we walk among them so they may touch our garb. Oh, we never did that. No, we, we do that. <laughs> There's no demand for it, to be fair. We mix and mingle. And we interesting, we discover mix and mingle is a turn of phrase introduced amazingly during the reign of Queen Mary and King George V who were the people who really invented the walkabout, also used about them. Mm. Yes, in episode three of <laughs> Harry and Meghan, it's all coming back to me now, Meghan says she's never heard, she'd never heard of a walkabout until she had to do one. Oh, please. Apparently she'd never heard of Prince Harry uh, well, no, until uh, she met him and had to Google him. Yes, you know, well, she never heard of her wedding on the day it happened. It happened the Wednesday before, apparently, privately in the garden with the Archbishop. We can move on. Oh, dear. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. You did remember say that? that, didn't I? She yes. did say that. Oh, mm -hmm. anyway, look... I wish, I seriously wish them well and hope it works out for them. Um, and I don't think here, it, I'm sure the king has not watched it um, because he doesn't watch much TV uh, the best of times. The queen enjoyed television. She might have watched it. She liked Line of Duty, didn't well, she? During lockdown, she did like Line of Duty. I say she liked it. The master of the household told me that he was watching it with her and he'd assumed this role of the explainer. She was watching it, but not following it I could have it done totally. with him as well. We all needed one of those. And they fell about laughing with him, trying to tell her what was going on. Do you think that she was keen to see Series 7? I mean, we love Ted Hastings, but we do we need another series of Line of Duty? I don't know. Uh, Giles, we've run out of time, but it's always so lovely to see you. Why don't you just come back well, in the New now Year I know and delight where you us are, again? And I know what a nice show it is. It is, honestly, it's the best show on radio. Well, well, I mean, well, you're being daft now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you for saying that, and it's always wonderful but, to see you. Look, we you gave me a nice quote stories. from my thing yes. i'm giving you a nice the best show on radio yeah well that's great we'll certainly until use the that. return of just a minute okay enough <laughs> right goodbye, right. goodbye now <laughs> have a lovely christmas <laughs> merry christmas to you and a happy new year so the book is out now it just is. in time for the festive very season. enjoyable your mum would love it it's called elizabeth an intimate portrait <laughs>